All right, this is chapter two, motion in one dimension. So in this chapter, we're basically gonna be looking at what we call kinematics. So which is basically study of motion. And mainly this is gonna be one dimensional kinematics, which means our motion will be along a straight line, either just horizontal motion or just vertical motion. So I mentioned that, you know, um, we will be using this uh, simplified models to describe our object, which means that we don't care about size or shape of, of any of the object that we will be considering that, you know, that will be undergoing some motion. Uh, and this particle model allows us to represent anything basically with just a, you know, just a dot, just a point. So for example, then the kinematics describes things like displacement, things like position change, which is displacement, right? So velocity, acceleration, um, how long does it take for the object to go from point A to point B and so on and so forth. That means any type of motion, uh, let's say, um, what's a measurement, right? Technically is part of what we call kinematics. And uh, one of the things we do here is, let's say, uh, just like we learned in the previous chapter, we need a coordinate system. And let's say here's the X axis, for example. Remember, we are considering, you know, the motion along a, in, in one dimension. So let's say it's, it's horizontal. Uh, that, we, that means we know that the object will only be in a, you know, in a horizontal motion. So let's say we always need some kind of reference point. So we take the origin to be the reference point. And let's say we have a, you know, let's say position. So this position, usually written as X sub I, that's our initial position. So then what I can do here is I can say, all right, so my object here is at X initial position at T equals zero seconds, right? That's basically our initial time. And then whenever the, our object moves from this initial position to some final position, whatever that final position is, so let's say somewhere over here, then we can look at that position, right? To be at some later time T. Okay, so some, you know, in a way you can say this is T initial and this is T final. All right, so we learn about vectors. That means I can take this and represent it as a vector. I can say, so this is basically that vector. All right, there are a number of things we can call this vector. So let's say you can call it this as delta X, right? Or you can call this like D, you know, vector, whatever, you know, in terms of this is displacement. Okay, and displacement is basically how far away you are from where you started. And it's a vector, that means it has a magnitude, size, and direction. So that's what we have with this, you know, displacement as a vector. All right. One other thing we can do here is this, right? So that means if we know those two information, let's say uh, the time it takes to go from X initial to X final, and let's say I have the, also this uh, delta X, then I can look at the rate at which, you know, this object was moving. That means going from X initial to X final. Did it go, did it take 10 minutes, 10 seconds, 10 hours, right? So basically how, you know, when you look at, let's say how far it is moved and for how long, and then you take the ratio of that, you basically get what we call average speed, okay? Or average velocity. Now there's a little bit of difference between um, average speed and average velocity. So let me kind of explain that. Average speed, which is here, is generally in terms of distance, over delta t because distance is not the same as displacement for example if you start from some you know some initial position and go to the final position so let's say you moved five meters in this direction so then what is your distance five meters what is your displacement five meters to the right because displacement is a vector then for example then let's say you come back you know five meters to the left then starting from your initial position, let's say, what is your uh, distance that now you cover? Well, the distance will be five meters in one way, five meters another way, so it's a 10 meter distance. But then what is your displacement? Well, you came back to the same position as you were before, so your displacement is zero. So that's why you can see, right? Distance and displacement, not necessarily the same thing. Distance is always positive. Distance is basically you move and you, you know, basically add, to the, to the distance value, right? So one, two, three, four, five meters, six meters, doesn't matter which direction you're moving. You just basically, 
you know, adding to distance as long as you're moving. Displacement is not like that. Displacement is, you know, you just basically start moving. So you, you, you need your starting point. And then when you stop moving and say that, okay, this is my final point, then you want to compare your final point relative to your starting point, how far away you are. If you come back to the same place, your displacement is zero. If you're five meters away from that to the right, that's your displacement. So that means, you know, displacement is a vector. It can be positive. It can be negative. It can be zero. Distance, you know, as, as soon as you start moving, right, it cannot be zero anymore and it can never be negative. So then what we do here is when we take the ratio of distance over time, that actually gives us average speed because speed itself is a scalar quantity and speed can also never be negative, all right? So speed just tells you how fast you're moving on average when you went, you know, through the distance. Okay, so, but if I can then take the displacement over time, displacement over time, this is, remember, displacement is a vector, so then this is a velocity. This is defined to be the velocity, well, technically average velocity again, but this is average velocity, which means that we are looking at the vector quantity. So that's why if you go from this x initial to this x final, if you can see, right, if this is your displacement, delta x, well, v average is proportional to delta x as a vector. That means v average will always have the same direction as the delta x, your displacement, because it's proportional to the delta x. So if your displacement is to the right, your velocity is to the right, or average velocity. If your displacement is to the left, average velocity is to the left. So also you can see that uh, the units, this displacement in meters over time in seconds, so this is the units for the velocity, meters per second. And we always use SI units, where the meters is the for, for the length and seconds for the time. So you might be given, let's say, miles per hour, feet per second, or you know, kilometers per hour, kilometers per second. We usually would need to then convert everything into meters per second. All right, so again, motion along, you know, of the object as it moves, you know, along the x-axis, right? Uh, we can then talk about, let's say, in terms of position known at all times. That means one of the things we can do, for example, is we, we can draw what we call a motion diagram. Okay, so let's say this is where we start from, right? This is point A, this is our initial position. And you can see, right, initial position is at 30 meters. But what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start um, measuring, let's say the position of the object at some you know, equal time interval. So let's say 10 seconds, right? And then for example, then measure position of the object 10 seconds later, which is happened to be here. Then another 10 seconds, well, this is here. Like, what does it mean? Well, this is, this is kind of like unfortunate picture. I wish they had a picture where it's basically the car actually, you know, moving, you know, shows that it's moving to the left, but this is just means that car is actually moving to the left here. That means it goes from A to B. That means that, you know, you can imagine it stops at B and then it's, you know, basically turn around and moving to the left now. So then 10 seconds later, the position is 40 meters. 10 seconds later, the position is zero. 10 seconds later, negative 40. And then negative, you know, maybe 50 or something like that. That means the car is moving to the right, stopping, and then going back to the left. So again, so we can basically look at the car moving back and forth along the x-axis. Now, this is something that you can always do, which is the pictorial representation. I always recommend to have some kind of rough sketch of the, of the problem. You don't necessarily have to draw a car. You can just use a particle, right? So I could have just said, okay, here's a car at point A, here's point B, here's point C, here's point D, E and F. So you can easily, you could have used the particle model, but you know, have a, some kind of rough, you know, sketch like that. So as I said, right, imagine we take data of the position of the car every 10 seconds, and then we have a data, right? So we have a data. So let's say we can say this is time, this is position. When the time is zero, position is 30. And let's say we can say this is in meters and this is in seconds. Then we have 10, 20, 30, right? And so on and so forth. When it's 10, it's 50. When it's 20, it's 40. When it's 30, it's zero, right? And so on and so forth. So forth. That means every 10 seconds, we measure the position of the object and we take a data like that. All right, so what can we do with that? 
we can use another tool. Remember, this was a tool, right? Pictorial representation is a tool. But using that, now we can have another tool, which is the graphical representation of the motion, which is known as a position time graph or position versus time. Position versus time always take position to be on the y-axis and takes the time to be on the x-axis. And one of the things we have here is the, for this particular case, right? Whenever we are looking at the, uh, let's say the motion of the, of this object, right? You know, you can then plot it along the, you know, let's say for this position versus time graph. Now, this particular motion is actually an example of what we call a non-uniform motion. So non-uniform motion means that the car or the, you know, our object here is basically moving such way that it's you know speeding up or slowing down. So we're going to look at it in terms of different type of motion uh, as we as we you know learn more. So we can see that every time the motion is non-uniform, non-uniform means changing speed in this case. So changing velocity or changing speed. But remember. Right now for us, slowing down and speeding up is technically means that you know, you're changing speed. And this particular type of graph then can be represented in terms of this non-uniform motion. All right, so what, we can do, what can we do with this? Well, one of the things we can do from here is that we can get some information. We can get some information because one of the things I have here is, see if I have a point A and B, and if I connect those points A and B together, um, then I can find some very important information. So for example, I draw a line between points A and B. By the way, I don't know if you, go the name, if you know the name of this line. If you know, the li you know the name of the line, it's good. If you don't know, this is actually a secant line. Not a tangent line, but a secant line. And what we do here is we use a secant line to connect two points, two different points. So here's the thing then. So we have this data, right? Just like I, you know, I put it over there. So we have data of the object motion. That means we are measuring position for every 10 second time interval. And what we did, right? We basically plotted in a position versus time graph. Now, if you go back to this graph, you can see that if I draw a, a second line, that blue is the second line over there. Then if I try to find the slope of that second line, I remember slope, as we learned in the you know, lab one, right, is rise over run. Now, if I do the rise, I can see that the rise over here is just nothing but the change in position. Run is nothing but change in time. That means slope is equals to delta x over delta t. Now, what I, what I have for then this delta x over delta t, well, that's defined to be the average velocity of the object between points A and B. That means as the object is moving from point A and B, on average, the velocity then can be found using the, you know, the second line and finding the slope, or physically speaking, it's just a displacement between A and B divided by time, right? So delta X over delta T or X final minus X initial over T final minus T initial. Units are very, you know, you know very identical to the speed meters per second, you know, for, you know, in the, in the SI unit, but you can say it's a length per time. Okay. Now, remember one thing, for example, if I go back to this graph, you can see that if I'm graphing the, from A to B, if I draw a line from between A to B, that second line and find the slope, I'm going to get a positive slope. Now, positive slope means positive velocity. Positive velocity means object from between A and B was moving to the right. And if I go back over here, you can see, right, between A and B, it was indeed moving to the right. This is being the velocity vector. So it is moving to the right, but you can see that what happens here is, you know, after point B, if you look at point B and C, if I draw a line like that, and look at average velocity between point B and C, or a graph like that, and look at B and D, let's say, or B and E, and so on and so forth, my slope will be negative. My slope negative means velocity negative. Velocity negative means, you know, from B to C or, you know, C to D and things like that, the car was moving to the left, which again agrees with the, you know, motion diagram that we have, this pictorial di diagram. 
All right, so again, average velocity is given as displacement over time. And it's the slope of the you know, position versus time graph, right? So basically, in that case, a second line gives you average velocity. Okay. Again, average velocity is geometrically speaking, you draw, you know, remember, so you need a straight line. So that's why you do that, you know, let's say this uh, second line and we get then the delta X over delta T, which in this case is average velocity. Then I can draw this, li this line and find average velocity between C and D. How about average velocity for the entire thing from A to F? Well, it's also simple. I draw that line and find the slope. So I'm gonna get average velocity. Let's see what we have. So in terms of then my diagram, right? Uh, my diagram tells me that initial position is right here, point A. Maybe, so let's say remember it's X final minus X initial over delta T. So let's see, my X final is position E. My X initial is position A. And this is delta T, which is 50 seconds. It's right going from zero to 50. All right, so then if I have that, I can then say, all right, so then V average is equals to X E position of E is somewhere over there. I'm probably gonna have that as uh, estimated as negative 55 meters. Then minus X A and X A is right here. I'm gonna estimate to be 30 meters divided by then 50 seconds. Okay, divided by 50 seconds. So then 55 minus 30, that's basically negative 85 meters divided by 50 seconds. So I'm gonna get one point, negative 1 1.7 meters per second. That means on average, my velocity was 1.7 meter per second in a negative direction, which makes sense, right? You move in a negative direction, you know, for a much longer time than you move in a positive, you know, X direction. So overall, it is net in a negative direction. One thing I could have also done here is I could have tried to find the distance, you know, that was traveled, which would have been adding this much distance plus that much over here, and then all of that over there. Why, why would I need that? I could have calculated average speed, which is distance over time. I could also could have calculated that. All right, so again, one thing we can do here is, let's say, if, if I kind of use this graph over here, see if I have this graph over here, I can get some very important, you know, let's say information about this as well, right? So I can get very important information about this as well. And that would have been finding the velocity at those specific, you know, let's say instances of A, B, and C, and D. I'm kind of gonna talk about that in a little bit later on, but one thing I have here is this. See, I can do, I can do let's say, a, you know, a tangent line at A, find the slope of that line, and that gives me what's the velocity at A. I can do tangent line at B and find what's the velocity at B. Tangent line at C, find the speed at C, D, E, and F. I think, sorry, I, I had it wrong over there. The, the final point is actually F, not E. But, you know. I, I use the same, I, I use the correct number. But in any case, you can find the slope and then have approximate, you know, velocity versus time graph. So velocity versus time graph, which remember if I look at point A, I'm gonna have a positive slope. Point B has zero slope. That means by the time I go from A to B, my velocity, right, X axis is the velocity, should go down to zero. And then after that, going from B to C, I have negative slope and a negative slope, another negative slope, all the way negative slope, which means that my you know, graph would have been negative, negative, negative. But then over there, I start slowing down. And eventually, let's say if I do, if you can see, right? If I look at the slope at F, it's again zero. That means I again slow down and stop. This just means that, you know, here, this is means you're moving in a positive X direction, but slowing down. From here to there, means moving in a positive X, I'm sorry, negative X direction and speeding up. Well, actually, you know, you speed up, 
you don't necessarily speed up over that. That means you technically, as soon as you have this shape of the graph, you are technically slowing down because you're speeding up all the way over here. So this is moving in the next direction and slowing down. Because remember, when you get to, um, let's see. Actually, never mind. All right, this graph is you know speeding up. Sorry, my bad. Speed up because remember, so this is zero, and then you go all the way to some you know negative v, right? So you're actually increasing your velocity, but you know in a negative direction. So you are speeding up all the way to point d. But then you can see right, your velocity decreases, decreases until zero. So then this segment is moving. So this was that, right? So moving in a negative x direction and then slowing down until you stop. Okay, that means this is again, this is moving in a positive x direction because velocity is positive. All the way to point B, velocity positive means you're moving to the right. And then velocity is zero at B, that means you stop at B. And then your velocity increases in a negative direction all the way until D, that means you're speeding up toward D. Then you start decreasing because that means this D here is your maximum speed in a, in a negative direction. Then you start slowing down. So this is slowing down until you stop at point F. Remember, this is velocity, right? So it means velocity here is zero at, you know, at that position uh, F or time of 50 seconds. All right, so ready to look at some simple example at least, you know, to start with. So your position of a runner as a function of time is plotted as moving along the X axis of a coordinate system. During the three second time interval, the runner's position changes from x1, which is 50 meters, to x2, which is 30.5 meters, as shown. What was the runner's average velocity? All right. So one of the things I recommend, you know, to have a, like a table with the given information. We're given x1, which is 50 meters. We're given x2, which is 30.5 meters. And we're given delta t. See, we're given like a time interval. So delta t is three seconds. And what we want to find then average velocity. Now, as, you, as soon as you put everything in front of you like this, it's easier to kind of visualize it. And then now you can just look at your table. You have x1, x2, which is x initial and x final and delta t and one v average. So that means we know that v average is displacement over time, which means then we can use this to calculate that. Well, displacement is, you know, x2 minus x1, and this is t2 minus t1 which means 30.5 meters minus 50 meters divided by three seconds of the time interval. So then V average is equals to, this is gonna be giving us nine, negative 19.5 meters and divided by three seconds. And that's gonna give us negative 6.5 meter per second. That means our motion is gonna be six meter per second speed on average heading to the left. Negative basically means that. All right, so let's look at another example. So we have an object that moves along the X axis. The graph shows its position X as a function of time. Find the average velocity of the object from point A to B, B to C and A to C. Okay, all right, so let's look at them. So what I have here is in order to go from A to B, like let's say and find the average velocity, we do a, you know, a second line. It means here's that line. So that means, you know, this is from A to B. What I, what I need here is for V average, I need like, let's say X of B minus X of A divided by T of B minus T at A. X at B is 25 meters. X of B, sorry, X of A here is zero. T of B is three seconds and T of A here is zero. Okay, which means V average is equals to 25 meters divided by three seconds. And that's 8.3 meters per second. It's positive 8.3 meter per second. It's moving to the right as it's going from A to B. Now let's do the B to C. What I'm gonna get here for the V average is this, XC minus XB over TC minus TB. All right, XC, which is position C is zero. XB here is 25 meters, TB here is six seconds, and T, uh, sorry, TC is six seconds, and TB here is three seconds. 
which give me negative 25 meters over three, three seconds. And this is gonna give me, well, it's gonna give me negative 8.3 meters per second. Okay. Now, how about from A to C? Well, from A to C, then what I have here is this. The average is equals to Xc minus Xa over Tc minus Ta. Xc here is zero. Xa here is zero. And it doesn't matter what this is, you're gonna get zero. Why? Because you're coming back to the same horizontal position, right? Which is x equals zero. Okay. Now, uh, then what, what I have here is the question B, which is would average speed be less than, equal to, or greater than the values you found in part, in that part? Well, it depends. For example, if I'm considering from A to B, then my average speed and average, you know, average velocity, average speed, remember, is distance over time. And then the displacement and distance are roughly the same. So are roughly the same. So you can say that average speed and average velocity are the same from A to B. Same thing but for the B to C. Average speed and average velocity magnitudes will be roughly the same. But average speed always positive, but we just learned, right? Average velocity from B to C is negative. So that means their magnitude will be roughly the same, but then the direction you know of the velocity will be negative where the you know speed is not even you know uh directional so that means it doesn't even have the direction but now i'm looking at for example from a to c well I, when i look at a to c then we just we just learned that my displacement here is zero but obviously my distance is not zero distance will be let's say going here roughly 30 meters another roughly 30 meters or sorry 25 and 25 so it's, it's, about, it's roughly 50 meters, that's my distance. So then, you know, average speed will be about 50, 50 meters divided by six seconds, right? So 50 meters divided by six seconds. Right, so let's see, I get, you know, well, 8.3, right? So pretty much same thing. So that means what I have here is the average speed is 8.3 which makes sense because it's like it's 8.3, 8.3, right? So that means, you know, average speed is 8.3, but uh, displacement is zero. That means average velocity is zero. So that's why here where they kind of disagree in terms of uh, magnitude, right? Average speed is 8.33, but average velocity magnitude is zero. All right, so we can also look at what we call instantaneous velocity. Because instead of, for example, me trying to see in a previous, in, let's say slide, right? When we looked at going from A to B, remember point A was zero time, point B was three seconds. That means when I calculate velocity of 8.3, that was average velocity for that three second time interval. But for example, so let's say if that's the graph, right? Let's say this is a zero, one, two, and this was three, which was point B, right? What if I want to, you know, at exactly, you know, two seconds or at exactly three seconds or exactly one second? That means I want to know some very specific instantaneous velocity. What is the velocity here at that time? What is the velocity at this time? Okay, so in this case, what we do here is we are thinking like this. So instead of kind of going from A to B, right? So you have a second line like that. So the second line takes this as your delta T. And then what I'm saying here is then as I go from that A to B to this point over here, right, let, me, let me call this point P prime. So that means I wanna find the, point, the, the time at that point P prime. That means that, to, that point is, um, um, assumes that I'm taking that this second line and I'm making it you know, smaller time interval, smaller time interval, smaller time interval, right? Until eventually what I get here is, I'm looking at when the time interval approaches you know, almost zero. And in that case, you know, that second line will end up as a tangent line. So more of like, like this, something like that. Ah. Like this. That means if I'm trying to then find instantaneous velocity at that point P prime, which is at this you know, specific you know, instant of time, then I need to look at, at the tangent, right? So instantaneous velocity is the slope of that tangent line uh, which is, you know, or the position versus time curve, okay? That means if I have a position versus time curve, 
I can use a tangent line to find speed at that point A. Ta tangent line, speed at point B, speed at point C, speed at point D, and so on and so forth. Where, for example, this is the second line, which gives me, you know, average velocity for that 40 second time interval, where the tangent line at point C gives me what is the speed or velocity at 20 seconds exactly. Okay. So that's kind of, you know, what we're doing. That means we're looking at the average velocity as a second line and instantaneous velocity from the tangent line. And the tangent line basically takes where the limit of delta t approaches zero for this ratio of delta x over delta t. And, you know, if you learn in calculus, right, that's nothing but the derivative of position with respect to time. So that means vx is the instantaneous velocity is then derivative of position versus time. That means dx dt. All right. Um, hopefully you guys have taken calculus and you know, you know some of those, you know, let's say rules of the, of, of taking the derivative. For example, you have the, you know, you have some kind of, you know, uh, let's say function u, which let's say depends on time. So let's say as a, as you know, u is equals to c times tn, where c is some kind of constant. And basically same thing with n is an exponent, but it's still some kind of constant. Now, then if I take the derivative of u with respect to time, then I'm taking basically the derivative of that, okay? So the way it works is basically, you know, taking the derivative, you know, it end up, you know, the rule for that is this. So you write down c, you know, basically, and then this n, as you know, which was the exponent goes down here. So basically becomes c times n, and then t becomes an n minus one, okay? That means you, your, your, your power goes down and then you subtract one from the previous power and then you have n minus one. For example, if u was three t cubed, then what you get here is if I'm doing du dt, then what I have is this. Remember the constant stays, but then the exponent, right, goes down three. And then basically you multiply your, you know, function, right, with the exponent three and you go t and then you do exponent three minus one, which then gives you nine t three minus one square. And that's basically the derivative of position, derivative of u with, with respect to t, okay? That means it's now becomes, you know, constant times the exponent times t to the exponent minus one. Okay, so nine times t squared. All right, so hopefully you guys remember this. This is relatively basic stuff and we're not really gonna go much, you know, much more complex than this. That means all of our derivatives are gonna be, you know, either, you know, first derivative or second derivative, right? Relatively, let's say straightforward, right? There's no chain rules, nothing like that. We are keeping it relatively simple, okay? So the instantaneous velocity can be positive, negative, and zero, okay? So when, it, when is it, let's say, uh, zero? When, let's say, your u here is equals to, for example, three. So when you do du dt, right? So there is no, you know, basically you don't have any function. That means there is no derivative. So the du is equals to zero, okay? Where what means that, you know, u here is some kind of constant because, you know, let's say, think thing like this, when u as a function of time is equals to three t cubed, like I had over there, right? See when u during the time when t equals zero, this is three times zero cubed so then u is equals to zero, right, at that time. But then when, for example, u when t equals one second, then you get three times one cubed, so equals nine. So you can see, right, it changes with time. But when u equals to three, it's time independent, it's just constant. t equals zero, t equals one, t equals three, t equals four, doesn't matter, u is equals to three no matter what, no matter what time you're considering. That's why, then derivative, which is the rate, of change of u is zero because u is not changing. That's kind of like what the derivative is, rate of change. And if you're not changing, if you're constant and not changing, then your derivative is zero. Okay. Again, instantaneous speed, which is the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity vector and speed can never be negative. Remember, speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector and magnitude of any vector, always positive, it never, you know, change, it's, ne it's never negative, um, you know, in terms, it can be zero, but it can never be negative. 
Okay. And again, here I have all of those, you know, it's basically what I just talked about, right? In terms of how to do the derivative of this function, you, so, you know, feel free to go over that. And if you're still a little bit confused, our book has a, you know, really good appendix, right? That kind of goes over some of this, you know, basic mathematics. So make sure you guys review that. Remember, the calculus is technically is a, uh, I, I wish it was a prerequisite, but it is, you know, at least a prerequisite. So that means it requires that you are right now taking calculus same time as you're taking the physics class. All right, so let's look at this example here. So this example will allow us to kind of get some, uh, you know, calculation and, you know, some derivatives and things like that. So let's look at this. So jet engine moves along an experimental track, which we're gonna use as, as X axis. We will treat the engine as if it were a particle. That means I can just say that this is just a particle, you know. So let's say I can say that this is just a particle. All right, so then its position as a function of time is given by the equation, where the equation is x equals a t squared plus b, where a and b are constants, that means they don't change, and they have values of a is 2.1 meter per second square, b is 2.8 meters. All right, so that means what we're gonna do then is we're gonna determine the displacement of the engine during the time interval from t1 equals three seconds to t2 equals five seconds. Then determine the average velocity during this time interval and determine the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity at t equals five seconds. All right, then. so let's start, you know, solving this problem. Again, what we're given here is x as a function of time is equals to a t squared plus b. Again, so then, let's say then a is 2.1 meter per second squared B here is 2.8 meters. Those are given to us. The next is determine the displacement of the engine during the time interval from when t equals three seconds to t equals five seconds. All right, so what we do is this. So let's call this, you know, t1 position when, you know, when the time is t1, let's call this x1. So during that t1. And let's say when t1 here is equals to three seconds. All right, so what we do here is we do a times three seconds square plus then, well, actually let me put what a is, right? A is 2.1, right? 2.1 meter per second square, then times three seconds square, then plus 2.8 meters. Because one of the things you need to make sure here is this, right? So this becomes, remember, this is second square, second square, so that that's gonna cancel out. Because this quantity should be in meters, so you can add another thing which is in meters. All right. We do this calculation, we're gonna get 21.7 meters. Let's look at x2, which is when it's, you have t2, which is five seconds. So this is 2.10 meter per second square times five seconds square plus 2.8 meters. Again, if we do this calculation, we should get 55.3 meters. That means that's x1 and this is x2. So then we want to find displacement, which is delta x. So this is x2 minus x1. So 55.3 55 meters minus 21.7 meters. So what we get here is 33.6 meters. And that's our displacement. That means this jet engine, right? In, uh, in this time interval of two seconds, cover 33.6 meters. Let's look at then part B, which is determine the average velocity. All right, so let's go to the next page. So an average velocity will be this. It's delta X over delta T, which is X2 minus X1 over then T2 minus T1. All right, so for X2, we had 55.3 meters. For x1, we have 21.7 meters. You know what, we, I could just put like whatever delta x we already calculated, but in any case, so. Then this is five seconds minus this is three seconds. And if I calculate this, I will get 16.8 meter per second. And that's my average velocity during this two second time interval, basically. All right, so this was part B. And here's finally part C, which is 
find instantaneous velocity. So basically, what is velocity at t is equals to five seconds? Well, in order for us to get this, we first need to find what is the velocity function as a, you know, velocity equation, you know, velocity function as a, you know, function of time, so let's like say. So we take velocity and we say the velocity is equal to the derivative of x with respect to time. That means the derivative of uh, x, which was a times t squared plus b. And then if I, you know, take the derivative of this, you know, what I get here, just like we talked about, right? So then a, then two, t to minus one plus, and since b is a constant, the derivative of that is zero. That means we'll end up as two t, two times a times t, sorry. Two times a times t. That's what we will have for the velocity. That means this is velocity as a function of time. All right, so then I can say now, how about velocity when t is equals to five seconds? It means it will be two times um, 2.8, sorry, 2.1, this is a meter per second square, then times t, which is five seconds. You can see right seconds cancels that because your units should be in meter per second because this is velocity. So we're gonna get 21 meter per second, All right? So this is then instantaneous velocity at five seconds. You can see, right, it's larger than that, which is the average velocity because average velocity takes into account the, some of this time when it was moving slower, right? Remember when it's, you know, it equals two seconds, at, at, sorry, let's say three seconds, four seconds, it's actually moving slower compared to five seconds, right? But this is taking into account all of those, let's say three, three, you know, three time intervals combined together. That means when it's time equals three seconds, when time equals four seconds, uh, you know, and five seconds, the average of those three. All right, so that's kind of like how we approach a problem like this. All right, so again, we have been talking about technically, uh, you know, uh, about uniform, uh, sorry, non-uniform motion. Non-uniform motion was when object would speed up, would slow down and all of those things, which is more or less more realistic motion, right? So you always, when you, you know, when you're moving, when you're driving, right? You don't just move straight line, constant speed, never change anything, right? So usually you slow down, you speed up, you turn around and things like that. That's more realistic motion. So that's why we kind of like, you know, I started with that. But it's, uh, it's possible that sometimes we can simplify motion and we say that, you know what, object could be moving in a straight line uh, with same speed, which is known as a uniform motion. Which means, for example, if I'm measuring the, let's say the, this motion diagram, Motion diagram, that means I, I have a position of the particle. So x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. And you can see, right, all of those, you know, basically the position of the object for, let's say, you know, exact equal time intervals. Let's say one second time intervals. That means, you know, going from x1 to x2 is one second. x2 to x3 is one second and so on and so forth. And you can see that you basically have exactly same displacement for all of those which means you are covering same distance or same displacement over time. And if you find, let's say velocity for each displacement, let's say this is V1, this is V2, this is V3, this is V4, this is V5. Well, they all will be exactly the same. They're all gonna have the same magnitude, same direction. So we can say it's a uniform motion or constant velocity motion because V1 is same as V2, same as V3, same as V4, right? They don't change. That's why it's constant velocity, but I usually call this a uniform motion. And if you plot uniform motion, you're gonna get a graph like that. No curves, nothing like that. It's kind of like a straight, you know, linear you know, graph like that. So, and if you, you can see, right, if you find the slope of this segment, time interval and this one and this one and this one, they're all gonna be the same again, because constant velocity motion. That means velocity, you know, is a slope and it means every segment of your graph should give you the same slope. All right, so that's why it's a relatively, you know, straightforward motion where we then take the object to just moving with the same speed, same direction, not speeding up, not slowing down, not changing direction for this chapter. Okay. So then object motion, you can see it's uniform. You can, you know, define it like this, right? If and only if it's position versus time graph, 
is a straight line. As soon as the graph starts curving like that or curving like this, right? Now that's a non-uniform motion, which means it's a, for example, uh, let me make this, a, let's say this, this orange one, right? Is actually speeding up. And for example, then this red one is actually slowing down as you move to the to the you know to the right. So that means each each graph ha has you know important information. Straight line is a uniform motion. The parabola right is basically speeding up and so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So then technically what we have is this. Remember this equation, right? Where v average is equal to delta x over delta t. But if thing like this, v average, what is v average? It's v1 plus v2 plus v3, let's say for example, divide by three. So let's say 10 plus 10 plus 10 divided by three. What do we get? 30 over three, we get 10. Which means if you have all of the same velocities, well, your average is also the same. That means there is no point of you know using even the average. We can just ignore the average and say this is just vx. That means vx equals delta x over delta t because you know vx is same as v average, same as v1, same as v2. And then using this equation, right, where you have delta x equals you know um, delta x over delta t, you move the delta t to the other side, becomes vx times delta t. Most of the time, delta t is this: it's t minus zero because initial time we can just set it to zero. So I can simplify this to just Vx times time. What is delta X? Well, it's X final minus X initial. Then I can change this into where I move the X initial to the other side. And then we have this equation over there. That means this is equation specifically for a uniform motion. Allowing us to find final position. If you have the initial position, constant velocity, and then you know how long the object is moving. So you can use this to calculate, you know, what, what would be your final position, okay? All right, so these equations can be applied to a particle or object that can be modeled as a particle moving under constant velocity. One other thing I can do from, the, from these graphs, um, remember I have position versus time graph. And let's say, for example, this is my graph. So then what I can do, I can, break it down and find the slope. And I can see that, that all the slope is the same. And let's say I find the slope, let's say I get 12 meter per second. Then I can, I can see that for all this time interval, my velocity is 12 meter per second. So I can use this to graph this one, which is velocity versus time, where the velocity is 12 meter per second, and it's not changing as a function of time, constant. All right, so now, what I can do from here is this. So let's say, for example, I'm gonna take this as my time interval, that means this is becomes, let's say, you know, uh, not V1, V2, because that's all the same, right? So this is V. Uh, and then this is my delta T, right? Or just T. Only put like delta T. Now, here's what I have. Sorry, velocity is here, actually. So let's say this is, if this is my V, right? So let's say this is what I have. This is my delta T. See, if I do V times delta T, what do I get? I get area, right? Area under that graph. But we also just learned that delta x is equals to vx times t. What it means that vx times t is the area under the velocity versus time graph. And that also equals to the displacement of the object. That means we can find the slope of the position versus time graph to get velocity or find the area under the velocity versus time graph to find then you know, displacement which in a way ends up being this. So remember, so if this is the, you know, the area, right? General equation you can say is this, delta x is equal to integral of v dx, sorry, dt, going from t1 to t2, let's say. So technically then, remember, this is nothing but the area, right? The integral is the area, it, because if you have some kind of like, uh, you know, velocity like this, you can still do the, that same thing. Area under the graph is technically equals to your displacement. All right, now going back to the non-uniform motion. So if you have non-uniform motion, we can do this. For a non-uniform motion, 
we have velocity that is changing. That means V1, V2, V3, they're not equal to one another. So if you're speeding up, you have this. If you're slowing down, you have that. That means, you know, as a function of time, you're speeding up, or as a function of time, you're slowing down. That means you have a delta V, which is basically not zero. Remember, right? So if you have a uniform motion, delta V would be zero, because if you do V2 minus V1, and they're both the same, you're going to get zero. But if you have non-uniform motion, delta V either positive or it is negative, depending in which direction you're moving. Now, then let's say you go from, um, let's say here's position X, one, X initial, and here's the object moving with some velocity uh, V initial. And then let's say at this position, X final, right? It is moving with some velocity, let's say, I'll make it a little bit longer, right? V final. That means you can see by the time it gets to final position, it's moving faster. Then what I can do here is if I, uh, again, measure the delta T, the time interval, then I can take the difference between final and initial velocities and divide by delta T, right? So that means delta V over delta T, and this is defined as the average acceleration. That means acceleration is rate of change of velocity. That means how fast your velocity changes, how fast that is increased, how fast that it decrease. Okay. That means that's why if you have a really fast moving car, like a race car, it has a really large acceleration because change in speed is very rapid, right? You, you know, it can change its speed very quickly. But if you're driving like, let's say, I don't know, a truck, then maybe that, you know, the velocity changes, you know, not as fast. So your acceleration is a little bit lower. So it's not as fast because acceleration is basically the rate at which you change your velocity. Greater value of acceleration means your velocity changes by a much greater amount. Also acceleration is a vector and it's proportional to the change in V as a vector. Okay, it's proportional to change in V. And generally what, what we have here is, um, let's say you sometimes wanna know the instantaneous, uh, sorry, inst instantaneous acceleration then again, similar way you can look at as a limit where delta T approaches zero and this ratio of delta V delta T becomes derivative of V with respect to time. Okay, that means acceleration is then derivative of the velocity, just like velocity is the derivative of position because velocity is the rate at which you change your position. Acceleration is the rate at which you change your velocity. So you then take, you can take then basically the derivative of, you know, velocity as a function of time to get acceleration. But also remember this velocity itself is a derivative of the position as a function of time. That means you're taking the derivative of the derivative, which means you technically can look at the acceleration as the second order derivative of the position as a function of time, all right? So for example, if this is your function, remember technically this U is a position. Let me do it like this. So let's say you have X as a function of time equals two T to the four right, 2t to the 4. Then I take derivative of this guy to get velocity, which this will be derivative of 2t to the 4. So then this will be, you know, 2 times 4 times t 4 minus 1, right? So then 8t cubed. That means this is now my velocity as a function of time. Then I can take the acceleration which is basically taking the derivative of this derivative, right? And, but we say that this derivative is just basically that, which means that it is derivative of eight T cubed, which then becomes eight times, you lower the exponent three, then T three minus one, all right? So then from here, what we do here is we do eight times three, which is 24, then t squared. And that's basically the acceleration as a function of time. That means you have position as a function of time, you take the derivative of that once, you get velocity as a function of time, you get the derivative of that one more time, you get acceleration as a function of time. Okay. Graphically speaking then, if you have a velocity versus time graph, Remember then, if I take the area under this graph, area is displacement. 
but I can also look at some specific time, you know, let's say TA, TB, TC, and I can find the slope of those times, right? At those times, right? And the slope is basically gives me acceleration. So the slope of the velocity versus time graph is the acceleration. So I can then use that to construct this graph, right? Because things like this, here I'm gonna get some positive acceleration. So I go there and I have a positive acceleration, increasing positive acceleration. Because see acceleration at this point is zero, then increases, increases, right? Until it gets to this TA, but after that it decreases, decreases until it's zero. See, it decreases until it's zero. But then it increases, but in a negative direction, increases, increases until it's zero. So then increases in a negative direction until it's maximum and then decreases until it's zero. And those times, right, you know, coincide. All right, so that means you can find the slope of the velocity versus time graph to get acceleration. All right, so you can write acceleration. So positive values correspond to where the velocity in the positive x direction. So this is in a velocity in a positive x direction. That means as long as the velocity slope, you know, let's say is positive, right? Because you can see, right, it's positive, 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 all the way until here when it becomes zero. So the, your graph will be above the T line. But then here is negative, 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 negative. So your graph will be below the T line. All right. <clears throat> So let's summarize most of those things. So negative acceleration does not necessarily mean that object is slowing down. This is a very important thing to, to like to understand, okay? Because what I have here is this. Whenever you are looking at objects motion, you wanna then look at it in terms of, um, let's say in which direction it is moving, okay? So, Negative acceleration means that acceleration vector is pointing to the left, but it doesn't mean that object is going to be slowing down. Object going to slow down because, right, if the velocity is negative and the acceleration is negative, both of them are negative, the object is actually not slowing down, it's speeding up. That means you want to compare velocity with acceleration directions and then understand what's going on. If both are, you know, let's say negative, that means, you know, you're actually speeding up. Same way, if both of them are positive, again, you will be speeding up. So that's why sometimes we call deceleration, which is commonly used to indicate an object is slowing down, okay? But we're not really using this in this, in this class. This textbook doesn't use it, and I usually don't use it. So that means acceleration means that you can speed up or slow down, because acceleration is defined as changing velocity. And velocity can change as, you know, decreasing speed or increasing speed. One of the ways you can figure out if object is speeding up or slowing down is look at velocity and acceleration. If they're in the same direction, the object is speeding up in that direction. And when object's velocity and acceleration are in opposite direction, then when the object is slowing down. So that's why saying that velocity is negative and you know, doesn't mean that let's say, uh, or let's say acceleration is negative, doesn't mean that the object is gonna slow down or saying velocity, Oh, let's, see, let's say saying acceleration is positive, doesn't mean it's gonna speed up. Again, you have to compare that to the velocity direction. All right, so let's look at another example here, which is kind of like, let's say an example that similar one I did over there. So you have a particle that moves along the X axis according to the equation where X equals three, uh, two plus three T plus one T squared, where X is in meters and T is in seconds. At t equals three seconds, find the position of the particle, its velocity and its acceleration. All right, so what I, sorry, what I have is this. So let's say at x at you know, t, right, I'm given as, this is two plus three t plus one t squared. So when I replace the t with three seconds, that means this becomes two plus three times two, sorry, three, plus one times three seconds square. Okay. Then what I get here is then two plus nine, then, all right guys, so there's actually a typo that I have. This should be negative. So this should be negative. All right, so this, let's take that as negative. All right. 
So then minus nine, okay, so we get two. That means two meters. Object position is two meters at t equals three seconds. This is A. For part B, what I need to do here is this. I need to find velocity at three seconds, but I don't have a velocity function. But I have, you know, I have dx because V is dx dt, which means taking the derivative of this. Remember, that means direct derivative of three plus, sorry, two plus three t, then plus one times t squared. All right, so this guy is a constant, so this is the derivative of that is zero. The derivative of this one is plus three. No, remember, so technically I need to correct myself. Everywhere is minus. So then uh, minus uh, 2t, the of this one is just 2t. Okay, that means it's then three minus 2t. So then I do velocity when t is equals to three seconds is equals to three minus two times three seconds. Then it's two minus six, right? Uh, and then this is gonna give me then negative three meters per second. Okay. Because this is technically meters per second, right? So we get that. All right, so then part C. Now acceleration. So what I do, I take this because this was for the velocity and take the derivative of that. So that means dv dt is the acceleration. It's gonna be then d dt of three minus two t, which means then, you know, the derivative of three, you get zero. The derivative of two t, you get then negative two. It means it equals to negative two. Now that means acceleration equals negative two. See that it doesn't have any time dependence, which means that it doesn't matter what time you are talking about, acceleration is always gonna be the negative two meter per second square. That means it's time independent quantity, means that this is constant. All right. Okay, so this is kind of what I was mentioning in terms of how to find velocity and acceleration and figure out if you're gonna speed up or slow down. So think like this, if you have an object, this is what we have for the uniform motion. Object always moving, constant speed, same direction. So this is now the, you know, so this is a uniform motion. And those two is non-uniform motion. Because what you have is this. See that this is the velocity vectors, right? So the red is the velocity vectors and velocity is to the right. The purple is acceleration. And because you have acceleration and velocity, both of them same direction, look at what happens to the red velocity vectors, increasing it with time, which means that you are speeding up or the car is speeding up. The last one shows that velocity is to the right but acceleration to the left, the opposite direction, which means that as a function of time, it's gonna start slowing down, right? But one of the things we have here is we also see that acceleration is constant here, which means, you know, the size of the acceleration and direction of acceleration doesn't change. And that's something we're gonna start, you know, considering for the remaining of this, of this chapter. We're gonna be looking at a motion of the particle with constant acceleration. That means we have motion where the object changes position changes velocity, right? And, but has constant acceleration. That means in a way we have this variable. So X initial, X final, V initial, V final, acceleration and time. So those are our kinematic variables. And any of the problems that we're gonna start solving after this, basically finding any of those quantities. Because there are lots of those, right? We have like, you know, five or six different quantities we actually have a lot of equations that we can develop and you know, work with. So these four equations are known as kinematic equations. So what I usually do, I give them numbers like this. Equation one, equation two, equation three, equation four, okay? 
So let's see what equation one is. Equation one is final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time, right? So this is known as like, sort of like, let's say velocity as a function of time. That means it tells you that if you know your initial velocity and acceleration and time, plug in and calculate your final velocity at some later time, okay? But you know, it allows you to solve any of those, you know, four variables. You can rearrange and solve for, solve for time or, you know, acceleration or initial velocity. But that's the equation that relates velocities and acceleration and time. Equation two, for example, then relates uh, position x final equals x initial. Uh, well, actually what I do here is, I'm gonna change the order, sorry. For me, order is this. So this is equation two, this is equation three, this is equation four actually. So technically I take that as, you know, equation four. So let's talk about equation two. Is the x final equals x initial, so x final position equals initial position plus initial velocity times time, then plus one, plus one half times square. From here then what we can do is this. You can you know, rearrange this any way you want and solve for the position, initial final, initial velocity, acceleration, and time. Okay, that's what the, that equation two does. Equation three relates final, final velocity square to initial velocity square to acceleration and displacement. And the equation four then relates final position to initial position, average velocity, you can see right, it's Vx final plus V initial, Vx initial over two, that's average velocity times time. All right, so we have four equations. The important thing about these equations, uh, basically in the detail, if you kind of pay attention, you will see, for example, equation one relates some of the things, but missing other quantities. For example, equation one, missing displacement. Equation two, for example, missing final velocity. Equation three, missing time. And equation four, missing acceleration. That means those are independent of those quantities, which means equation one is position independent. Equation two is final velocity independent. Equation three is time independent. And equation four is acceleration independent. And what we can do here is determining, let's say what equation, let's say, or what equation to use can also, you know, allow us to understand, let's say, which, let's say, uh, variable, even if, even if it's missing, can be omitted, and we still can, let's say, use this equation to calculate the unknown. So those are known as kinematic equations, assuming that you have a constant acceleration.